We tried to think about most primitive information we have. Regarding our our extraordinary experience is that I think we choose the fact that all humanity has always been born naked, absolutely helpless for months, and though with beautiful equipment, as we learn later on, no experience, therefore absolute ignorance. That's where all humanity has always started. And we've come to the point where in our trial and error, finding our way, <laughs> stimulated by a designed in hunger, <laughs> designed in thirst. <laughs> These are conscious inputs, <laughs> designed in procreative urge. <laughs> we have, plus an enormous amount of, as we learn later on, designed in automated <laughs> processing of the interrelationships of our, all the atoms in our organism. We start in then with the, a consciousness of the hunger, <laughs> giving a drive to go after, <laughs> and to seek, to experiment. Man having then <coughs> no rule book, <laughs> nothing to tell him about that universe, <laughs> has had to really find his way entirely <laughs> by trial and error. <laughs> He had no words, <laughs> had no experience to assume the other person had an experience. <laughs> they had at first a very incredibly limited way of communicating. <laughs> we now know human beings being on our planet for probably three and a half million years, with, as far as we can see, not much physiological change, <laughs> pretty much the same skeleton. And I what we can learn of human beings in their earliest recorded communicating in, in an important degree. People in India 5,000 years ago, China 5,000 years ago, were thinking very extraordinarily well in terms of what, anything we know about our experience, the way we've been able to resolve the experiences into the discovery of principles that seem to be operative in our universe. I'm, I'm astonished at how well the early Hindu Chinese thinker, how well he was able to process his information in view of the very much, very limited amount of information humanity had as of that time com in, in comparison to anything we have today. Just making a little jump on information, as we as humanity on board of our planet entered into what it called World War I. <laughs> These scientists around the world have ways of reporting to one another f officially, and the chemists have what they call chemical abstracts. And the chemical abstracts are methodical publication of anything and everything any chemist finds that he publishes information regarding it, which comes in chemical abstracts. <laughs> as a world entering World War One in the 20th, what's recorded in the 20th century, it's a very arbitrary kind of a counting matter, we had some hundred, I think it was hundred, I'm doing this off the top of my head, my, my memory, about 175,000 known substances, possibly almost a quarter of a million substances by the time the United States came in the war known to chemistry. But we came out of World War I with almost a million substances known. <laughs> By the time we entered World War II, we were well up into 10 million. <laughs> and we've come out of it now where we, the, the figure is really getting to be astronomical. <laughs> we can't really keep track of the rate at which we're discovering more. Just talking about differentiable substances, <laughs> the ke chemically distinct from one another. Those, those are typical of the information <laughs> Really, it's a, it's a, it's a bursting, bursting rate now in, in, in relation to 
I'm speaking in relation to my own life. One, one life and the, and, the, and the extraordinary numbers of lives there must have been on board of our planet. That the information is in, in multiplying that rate during just one lifetime <laughs> indicates that something is going on here right now that is utterly unprecedented and we're in such indication of acceleration <laughs> of experiences human beings, the integration of the accelerated, the experienced to produce awarenesses that are indicative of humanity going through some very, very important kind of transition into some kind of new relationship to the universe, I'd say. That the kind of acceleration that would occur after the child has been formed in the womb, <laughs> taking the nine months, and, and, and then suddenly begins to issue from, from the womb <laughs> out in, into an entirely new world. So I think we're, we're apparently coming through out of some common womb <laughs> of uh, designedly permitted ignorance, <laughs> given faculties which we gradually discover and learn to employ by trial and error. <laughs> and we're at a point where I've, I now have what would also seem absolutely incredible to generations before. I've now completed 37 circuits of our Earth, kind of zigzagging circuits, not, not straight around, not tourists, just responding to requests to, to appear here and there to lecture at universities or to design some structure, whatever it may be. So <clears throat> that, that, that is in the everyday pattern that, that I'm circuiting that earth. Certainly makes it in evidence that we are dealing in a, a totality of humanity, not the, or up to, up to my generation, completely divided humanity, spread very far apart on our planet where my father was in the leather importing business in Boston, Massachusetts, United States. And he imported from two places primarily, the Buenos Aires and in India for bringing in leathers for the shoe industry, of, uh, which was centered at that time in, in the Boston area. And his mail or a trip that he would like to make to Argentina took two months each way and his trip to India and the mail took exactly three months each way. And it was very, seemed absolutely logical to humanity when early in this century, Rudyard Kipling, the English poet, said, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> the, the very, very rare matter for any human being to make such a travel as that, taking all those months. There were not many ships that could take him there. All that has just changed in my lifetime to where it's a <coughs> I'm not just one of a very few making these circuits of the earth, but I'm, I'm one of uh, probably getting to be pretty close to 20 million now who are making, living a life like that around our planet. And very much the whole young world doing so. I, I keep meeting my students at various universities from around the world, halfway around the world again. They're, they're, they're all getting to be...